sea is the most permanent of all things in this changing world. Man has been able to alter the face of the earth a little with buildings and bombs, but the mighty waters remain as they were before his advent, unchanging and unmastered. And so perhaps it's natural that the men who win their living from the sea are themselves rather resistant to change. Nonetheless, in Australia at least, most fishermen of today realise that it's to their advantage to make use of modern equipment and scientific knowledge. There is a practical example of this attitude in the fishery of edible sharks. Yes, not all sharks are man-eaters. These two species of small sharks are harmless to man and they also make very good eating. The one on the right is a gummy shark. The other is a school shark, which never grows any longer than five or six feet. You can easily distinguish it by its pointed, translucent nose. See how the light shows through it. Edible sharks make up about a third of the weight of fish landed in southeast Australia, so they're an important item of the national diet. Their flesh is delicious, and there aren't any bones to worry about. Unfortunately, the weight of sharks caught is showing a marked decline. After the peak year, 1953, according to the official figures, there is a very steep and continuing drop. Investigation into the life of school sharks was started in 1946 at the request of the Victorian and Tasmanian governments who were perturbed about the falling catch from inshore areas. The inshore take rose during the war years, owing to intensive fishing for the sake of the liver oil, then dropped sharply. After a brief rise in 1949, the take has now fallen to what it was 20 years ago, and it is still falling. Scientists of the CSIRO set about discovering the reasons for this. They found out all they could about school sharks, where they bred, their rate of growth, what they ate, everything in their life cycle. To get this information, it was necessary, literally, to keep a tag on the sharks. At first, tags were only attached to the fins, but it was found that these were prone to tear out, so in addition, plastic tags were inserted internally. This has no adverse effect on the sharks and the small incision heals very quickly. Results soon began to come in from fishermen who caught the tagged sharks and sent in details of size, sex and location of catch. Usually only the tags are returned, but this is an actual shark that was recaptured over four years after being tagged as a juvenile at St Helens. It had doubled its length before being caught as a six-year-old by a Port Albert fisherman off the Kent group in Bass Strait. The thin tag had been torn out long before recapture, but the internal tag told the story. Gradually, the travel pattern of the school shark emerged. It was found that the females dropped their young in late spring and early summer when they move into the shelter of shallow bays and estuaries in southeast Australia. The localities selected for observation were Port Arlington, Port Sorrell, St Helens and Pitwater. After giving birth, the mothers leave the nursery areas to look for food. The young sharks of two years of age or more tend to move towards eastern Bass Strait, where the main body of immature school sharks is centred. Those newly born remain until late summer and then move slowly out to spend the winter in deeper coastal waters. Most of them return in the spring. In the autumn, the adult sharks migrate into the warmer waters of South Australia and New South Wales, or they may merely move out towards the edge of the continental shelf, indicated by the dotted line. It is during this migration, and on their return in the spring, when they spill through the four entrances into Bass Strait, that fishermen levy toll on the travelling sharks. They used to be able to get big hauls working from small boats like these and never getting out of sight of land. Now they have to travel 80 or 100 miles offshore to get a worthwhile catch, and this means building bigger boats and using more expensive gear. These boats are lying at Stanley, near the northwest tip of Tasmania. Some of them have holes bored and watertight bulkheads sealing off their midship sections to form wells where the sea, swilling through, keeps the catch fresh. They take aboard supplies of ice for the same purpose. The bigger and more modern boats, like the VSP, have built-in wells supplied by pumps. They also have their own freezing systems. The shark boats are generally powered by diesel engines. Echo sounders are much used to check on the depth of water, type of bottom and shoals of fish.
Remote control of steering enables this skipper to leave the wheel during the tricky operation of picking up his long lines. An engine-driven line hauler saves all the hard labour of pulling in the shark-laden lines by hand. Two-way radios are a wonderful boon. Fishermen can now talk to their home ports, get weather reports and hear from other boats. These are Queenscliff shark boats setting out from the Victorian side of Bass Strait. They're baiting their long lines with pieces of mullet. This boat uses an echo sounder. When the fishing ground is reached, the first of the flag buoys is tossed overboard and the long line with its hundreds of baited hooks is skillfully cast out as the boat moves slowly forward. Albatrosses are a familiar sight in Bass Strait. After laying several fleets of lines, the boat returns to the first one put over and starts to pull it in. Good luck, the wells are filled after pulling up a number of fleets and sharks are piled on the decks. On the way home, the sharks are gutted and beheaded and as soon as the boat secures to her wharf, unloading begins. Edible sharks find a ready sale in the fish markets. They are generally retailed under the name of flake. Hey, fish I've got. What happened? What happened? What happened? Give it down, find a stag. Seven, eight, one, nine. What happened? What happened? Give it down, find a nine. Seven, one, nine. What happened? All the sharks sold in the markets were born in one or other of the nursery areas. From the air, you can see the channel, followed by female sharks going into pup in the Pitwater Estuary near Hobart. This is one of the sheltered nursery areas where scientists from the fisheries division of the CSIRO set lines in early summer to catch female sharks, heavy and young, for their research work. In the past, fishermen in Victoria made some of their biggest hauls in the nursery areas during spring, when the females came into pup. These raids not only slaughtered a great number of females at the time, but owing to the additional destruction of the unborn young, their effects are still apparent in the present reduction in the overall numbers of sharks in southeastern waters. It has been found that female sharks do not bear pups till they're about 11 years old, and then only produce about 30 young at a time instead of the thousands that other fish do. In addition, they only reproduce about every two years. For their protection, the Commonwealth Fisheries Office agreed with the four shark fishing states on a close season for school shark for one month each year. Unfortunately, three states withdrew from the closure, but they agreed to retain a minimum legal length of three feet. Professional fishermen now know better, but to some unobservant sportsmen, any shark is a potential man-eater and is instantly killed. This is a pity because school sharks are easily recognised and are quite harmless to men. Only 7% of the world's fish catch is landed in the southern hemisphere. Australia is therefore poorly off for fish and her edible sharks are a valuable national resource. Australians who go fishing can help preserve them by putting back all school sharks under three feet long and leaving the nursery areas alone in late spring. Then the shark boat skippers may often hear this sort of message. And the fishing's fine. Never seen so many sharks in the strait before. Good luck to the VSB.